uh, as someone who's done the principal development for Vault DB and worked on uh, a great amount of internals for Vault DB, please welcome software engineer for Vault DB, Ariel Weisberg. So, uh, as was mentioned, I've been working on Vault DB for four years. Uh, it's a project that I'm still very passionate about. I really think that uh, for distributed SQL databases, and especially row stores, we've really barely begun to scratch the surface uh, what can be done to improve uh, scale out SQL. Uh, on this slide, I've got a link to my blog, fewmarnets.com. Uh, I blog about uh, my work on Vault DB, a lot of the low level nuts and bolts of uh, what's involved in implementing features, and uh, a lot about Linux, uh, both uh, disk and network I.O., and various data structures. So uh, the agenda for today, uh, I'm going to start out with an overview, uh, and the overview sort of has two parts. Uh, the first part is very high level. Um, first slide is a throwdown, accusing other databases of being insufficient. Um, and following that, it's a couple examples of what Volt tries to keep in a, in a distributed SQL database. Um, and what use cases we're really trying to optimize for. And we give a couple specific examples. And then we do the deep technical dive. Uh, so I'm taking questions the whole time, um, but it might be a good idea to wait for the technical portion to start asking questions, because there's a lot in the beginning uh, that sort of elicits technical questions that are going to be answered later. Uh, and after that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cool features in VoltDB 3.0. Uh, a lot of that's going to be, you know, basically we'll be 1.0 that you are going to work with it for. Uh, and then I'm going to do a demo. And the demo has two parts. I'm going to review an example application that we ship uh, with the database uh, and show what a multi application looks like and uh, some of the application logic and how it works, I think, better in MultiDB than it would if we had an equivalent implementation uh, against another database. Uh, and then there'll be Q&A. So, Choose your favorite scaling challenge. Uh, anyone had any problems with I.O. bottlenecks in their database? Random I.O., random reads? How did you get around it? Anyone doing memcache? Yes. Memcache in I.O., can you read us? 2.6 is awesome. I really uh, think the Lua scripting they had is uh, a big step forward. It sounds familiar, too. Um, so yeah, I.O. bottlenecks uh, are very disruptive for traditional disk-based databases. Uh, and they suffer on two fronts, both from doing random I.O. for reads, which on traditional disks doesn't really scale all that well, and then even when they're using flash SSDs, random I.O. on writes. Uh, in addition, even when you have something like flash that's scaling random I.O. on reads, performance could be inconsistent, latency can be inconsistent, and at the end of the day, even enterprise-grade flash is actually more expensive than PCC RAM. Uh, so, People try to get around it. They try and cache their data. Uh, things like memcached D or having read slaves and read replicas. Usually this replication is asynchronous. So now you're pushing more work on your application developer. They have to deal with stale reads from slaves or decide, do I need to read from the slave? Do I need to read from the master? Is this causing my application to bug? Uh, and then with uh, caching, caching especially like memcache, you're going to deal with another layer of inconsistency. It's something that's lag, potentially lagging behind the master database. Uh, and you're also paying to have your data in RAM twice, once in memcache and once in public database. Um, so another scaling challenge is, okay, let's say you want to try and throw money at the issue to solve it. Well, if you're trying to scale up, uh, you're actually going to you know, run into diminishing returns if you start with a single node product. Um, so the more money you throw in, the more disk arrays, the more RAM, the more, the more sockets, the more expensive it gets. Uh, and you're also running the licensing issues. Now you're paying for more sockets, more cores, or you're moving to more expensive single node products that are better tuned. And there's the also additional the IT ops expenses of maintaining this uh, more exotic hardware rather than commodity white box hardware you can order from New Egg, get a replacement immediately. Uh, people are also dealing with giving up or giving sacrificing richer data models. So they're switching to the key value stores or the document model. Uh, where they're forced to really store their data the way they want to query rather than uh, the way that would be most normalized uh, and have the most deduplication. Uh, they also have to give up the relational model, which means they have fewer options for declarative querying um, and more potential for having conversions of data. Uh, so you'll, people also end up 
giving up transactions, which I think is the big one. So now you're pushing a huge level of complexity onto your application developer. Um, there are other databases that wouldn't want to scale writes, especially uh, end up using weaker isolation levels or no isolation at all. Uh, and really, when you give enough asset in transactions uh, and you get more operations in a database to concern, is it really faster than what you needed for transactions? You may end up building transactions yourself, possibly correctly, uh, out of smaller database operations. And in the end, uh, you, may, you may actually have no additional performance. And then, uh, application control sharding. So you don't have a single mode, you know, single mode database product that you're deployed on, you're familiar with it. So you take the next step and you shard it. And now you're dealing with uh, increased complexity for distributed queries. You're now writing your own distributed query for an optimizer uh, and executors. Um, this complexity in the application, is this key available on this node? Uh, and then add another piece of data, cluster-wide metadata that you have to keep consistent. Uh, and that, again, increases your software development costs. Uh, and really, all, all of these things impact total cost of ownership. When you have IO bottlenecks, you buy more hardware. When you have give up data model transactions and, that, and you do application control sharding, you're pushing more work in house that you could leverage uh, in a more scalable way if you were able to buy it from your database, if it came with your database. So, uh, lose the bathwater, keep the baby, or as I like to call it, leave the gun, take the cannolis. Uh, so, how does Volt address I.O. bottlenecks? So, in-memory operation eliminates I.O. bottlenecks. Uh, and when I say I.O., I'm not just talking about disk I.O., since so we're replacing uh, physical disk I.O. with random, with, uh, random memory I.O. Uh, I'll talk about later how we can actually eliminate network I.O. as well. We can eliminate ground trips from client to server that are um, more feasible when you're working with a disk-based system that's spending most of its time blocking on disk, and when transactions run along, it's not a big deal. Uh, what Volt actually does is it executes transactions serially, so single-threaded, back-to-back, no interleaved execution, which means we can abide all the concurrency control <coughs> mechanisms that traditional databases have to use in order to have these long-running transactions that are waiting on disk. Um, and we're not cheating on durability either. Um, it turns out that durability is the easy part for an in-memory database because if you want to check on your database, you just write the entire data set. You don't even have to track what the 30 pages are. It's sequential I.O. It's cheap. You can use a traditional spinning disk without issue. Um, and write ahead logging itself doesn't actually have to have as much impact as you think, uh, especially if you switch to some form of logical logging, like the one both of implements. So money, how do we, how do we help you money less? Well, Brand seems expensive, but it's cheaper than enterprise grade flash. Um, so we work on commodity hardware, so there's no prior um, proprietary interconnects, it works with regular Ethernet, um, and regular dual socket web box servers. Um, and if you need more performance, you don't have to buy exotic hardware to scale a single node. You can just add more nodes until you have the level of performance you need. We're also really focused on getting value from your hardware at every step of the way. So doing useful work in your database as opposed to busy work waiting on disk I.O. or shoveling metadata around to deal with uh, the latency of disk. Uh, we also have open source and commercial versions. The, uh, the commercial version adds features to the open source version. Uh, so VoltDB keeps the relational model, which is fitting for uh, MySQL meetup. Uh, and we keep SQL. So you have a declarative query language, so your database has, which has a has knowledge of the layout in memory and the layout of data in the cluster. It allows us to pick the most efficient execution plan, and it saves you from rewriting the boilerplate of doing your own distributed joins or distributed queries. We're also keeping transactions. So, and not just transactions with weak isolation levels, we're keeping serializable isolation. Uh, and we do that with serial execution. And that's made possible by the fact that everything is in memory. We don't need to run long-running transactions. Uh, so we can all do it all single-threaded and get that serializable isolation. So VoltDB also does sharding for you. So VoltDB manages the sharding. If you want to know where a query is routed, you just submit it to any node in the cluster and the query will get answered. Um, VoltDB will also handle resharding your data, changing shard keys if you need to do that. This is, again, not something you have to write yourself. And VoltDB also supports cross-partition queries and joins. So if you want to do the occasional roll-up on you know, the data you incrementally materialized in Volt, you can do that. So 
high velocity database requirements, sort of the niche Bolt is trying to fill, um, handling lots of independent events that are happening at very high frequency. So we're talking about millions of transactions per second, and we tested that actually with uh, version 2.0 uh, on a, a 30 million cluster. So we've got 33 million transactions per second, and every one of them was a write. Um, also, maintaining high availability in the face of failures. So Bolt be supports replication, it's transparent, you can do reads and replicas, and uh, it's synchronous replication, so you don't have to deal with scale data when you might want to scale up, scale up reads by, by replication. Um, and failover management is transparent. If the node goes away, the cluster just resumes operation once it agrees that the, that the node is dead. Uh, and then you can rejoin the node at a later time without blocking the database. Uh, VoltDB also supports compl complex manipulation of state per event, which, or per transaction. So we're really focused on not just giving you SQL, but we want to give you something you didn't have before. So we have these Java stored procedures where you can put arbitrary application logic in the database. You can build new data models on top of bolts if you want to build you know, capture collections or TTL. That's something you can do. And you can actually do efficiently, just about as efficiently as we would do if we were to write into the story of it ourselves. Because in Bolt, when you're running a store procedure, your data is just a function call away. Another thing we're really focused on is integrating with other databases. We're not trying to be everything to you. We're trying to solve the specific problems that a high-velocity database would satisfy. So lots of events, millions per second if necessary. Um, and then if you want to feed data that's generated inside Bolt to another system so that you can run analytic queries and say column store or HDFS, you can do that. We have uh, export connector that basically has the semantics. You have a table, you declare it as an export table, you insert a row into it, and Volt will ensure at least once delivery of that row to the companion system. And these companion systems can be uh, drive loading drivers that are hosted inside a Volt server that load the data to the database or process of your choice. Or you can use uh, out-of-the-box ones, like an export to file, which exports to CSV on the local disk of the server, or a JVC, you can insert directly into MySQL or Postgres. Um, so we really want to give you options to solve the problems with the best tools, not just our tool. So some example use cases. Um, so the left-hand column has a list of data sources, and they all have a, a, a couple things in common. So they have data sets that are typically bounded, um, so Capital markets, they can keep a day's trading, um, and they may have keep some historical data for back testing, but they can they store that as a log or in a database more optimized for sort of append only storage. Um, something like call initiation requests, there's only a fixed number of calls in flight at any given time. Once the call's over, well, that's historical data, you can export it to a companion system. Um, and that's sort of the trend. They have data sets that fit in memory, either because the entire data set fits in memory or because only part of it is actually being accessed in an OLTP transactional manner at the time. So the second column, we have uh, a list of what the high frequency operations are. So this is Volt's sweet, pot, sweet spot. The thing that we do that's sort of unique is that we can you know, support millions of transactions per second, uh, but complex transactions. So you can have something like real-time authorization, have your arbitrary application logic, um, and it's all done inside the database. There's no back and forth between client server. Um, and you can also maintain things like materialized view because we kept SQL, we kept the relational model. That's less code that you have to write, less data that you have to maintain. Um, and less logic you have to do to get efficient lower frequency queries or distributed queries. So that's the second problem, which are the things that Bolt can do uh, for you in a, in a distributed manner. So if you have a materialized view that you're maintaining, you can uh, get that roll up in a distributed query. And Bolt will push down the aggregates and handle all performance stuff for you. Uh, and so, some specific examples, like for rank stores, MultiB has counting trees, so you can do rank queries. Uh, and that's about it. So, so under the hood, now we're getting technical. Now's a good time to ask questions if something doesn't make sense to you, because either I'll get to it in the next slide, or I better answer. So this is my slide added to this deck, um, and it's what I think makes MultiB different from most other approaches to databases, uh, specifically SQL databases. Um, so there are other in-memory databases. There are definitely a lot of good ones. Uh, not that many distributed ones, um, but they're coming. They're coming. Uh, 
And our database is that it have an emphasis on server-side logic. So like Redis just can have a little scripting and it can run hundreds of thousands of scripts a second on a single thread, which is impressive, but you can't get that many packets to it. So. Um, and so yeah, Bull has an emphasis on fast server-side logic. Um, so we're using Java for our stored procedures. We actually pre-compile all the sequels, so we don't have to normalize the SQL, which is surprisingly time consuming. We can run it against cached query plans. We get all the cache friendliness that are using input and output memory areas. Um, so for example, TPCC, uh, we have actually a TPCC light benchmark that we run. It's got an average of 26 SQL statements per transaction. And some of these transactions are scanning hundreds of thousands of rows. Uh, and we're doing joins, we're doing you know, the real SQL thing um, at 50,000 transactions per second. So the amount of data you put inside your server-side logic doesn't actually have that much of an impact on uh, how many of these transactions you can do. Just we have a glut these days of cores, uh, even on a two-socket quad-core system. Um, really, the most expensive part is getting the, the transaction into the database. And that's why it's so helpful to have expressive and fast server-side logic. And the last trick we do, which I'm going to get into, uh, is that as a distributed database, we do sharding. And I'll explain what that is uh, if you've never heard of it before. Uh, but we do it to the core level. So we're actually providing, pushing our shared nothing architecture all the way down to the CPU core, where there's actually a big need to have some respect for the hardware and the latency of communicating between threads. And that's where avoiding all this locking and latching becomes important, because there's a bus there, it's, it's a network, and it's really expensive when things start contending on the same memory location. Uh, also, it's not a reformulation of disk based concept. We don't use the same data structures, data structures, there's a buffer pool, there's a block manager. But we take a different approach to how we do everything when it comes to pushing data and export, when it comes to pushing data and export, or doing command logging, we're optimizing for this thread per core approach. Uh, whereas I, I think the vast majority of databases have uh, thread per connection. So, and I think it adds up to more than the sum of its parts. So, uh, architectural overview, where did, where did Bolt come from? So there's an academic project that was a collaboration be between MIT, Brown, and Yale. Um, these are the same people who worked on C store, which is a column store. So H store is a horizontal it's a row store. Um, and uh, Bolt is sort of the row store version of C store. It's a complete rethink of how would I implement an a OLTP database that is optimized for, you know, these small, smaller transactions with a high velocity. Um, so they were focused on looking at what the overhead of traditional databases was. So uh, one of the papers they referred to is the research of the Shore Project. It's an academic database, so state-of-the-art academic database. So uh, not commercial, but they looked at where the time of execution time ran. And the vast majority of it went to locking, latching, logging, basically all overhead, and maybe 2% of CPU time was actually spent doing useful work. Um, and what they wanted to do is eliminate all those sources of non-execution and not useful work, not actually processing rows, not accessing, not actually processing messages. Uh, and so the locking, latching, the logging, they came up with strategies to eliminate all of those, and they're all, you know, roll forward from having all your data in memory. Um, now that you have all your data in memory, you no longer have to have weights on both disk I.O. and user logic, thanks to stored procedures. So now you can serialize the execution of transactions and avoid any latching or locking at all, because these data structures aren't shared anymore. Uh, and then they wanted to build it to scale across commodity servers so that you get a lot of throughput on a single node, thanks to having an in-memory system that shards down to the core level, even on one node. And then they want to get linear scalability as the cluster grows. So again, leveraging the shared, same shared nothing architecture that gives you good scale up on a single node. And that requires that you partition your data across your shared nothing commodity cluster. So BoltDB supports two types of tables. Partition, which are the auto-sharded tables that Bolt manages for you. So these tables are for your hot data sets, so either lots of load coming into the data, or it's just a large data set, and so you want to spread the data out for storage reasons. Uh, and to client applications, there's just a database, and they submit queries, and the data, database routes them to the place they need to go to. Volt uh, also supports replicated tables, which is unique, I think, even among these sort of sharded databases. 
um, started with SQL databases. So replicated tables are good for data that's infrequently changing. And the reason we're focused on infrequently changing is that you, you need a distributed transaction to modify a replicated table. Because you still want to maintain serializable isolation, even though every single shard, every single thread in the entire cluster has access to it. Uh, and you also want to keep the footprint small, because again, you're keeping a copy of this data at every end. So, for partitioning and sharding, what Bull requires of you is that you identify how you want to distribute the data across the cluster. Uh, so you're going to specify a partition key, which is some column on your partition table. And that column will be hashed and for each row and the value for that row. And then the row will be sent to the correct partition. Um, and Bull does this for you automatically. So the scaling model visually looks something like this. So in this example, there's servers X, Y, and Z. Uh, and there are three different tables, A, B, and C. And each of these servers in this image has a single partition. That's why there's only one set of A, B, and C at each node. So there's at node X, A prime, B prime, C prime. And so if that was partition zero, all the values that hash to partition zero would end up there. And there's no example of replicated tables. That's not what I'm doing. Okay. So inside of multiple partitions. So most databases use shard terminology. Um, we've been using partition. So a partition is uh, one subset of your data. And a partition can be replicated. Uh, and so there's a master for that partition and a slave. And if the master fails, there's a leader election, and it's replaced. Uh, and so each of these partitions is one of those single-threaded things I was talking about. It's uh, because it's got an execution engine attached to it that's a single thread. And then it's got the input queue, where all of its tasks come in. So the input queue can consist of stored procedures or planned fragments for distributed transactions. And if a planned fragment for a distributed transaction comes in, all the single shard transactions destined for that shard have to wait for the distributed transaction to finish to maintain serializable isolation. Uh, and basically, everything in the lower box, the table data, the index data, the views, that's all accessed without any concurrency control whatsoever. Because it's single threaded, it has exclusive ownership to the data. Uh, this is a huge boost um, for the hardware as opposed to threadbare connection, because now we're acknowledging that this is the data I need to have on this core. And when a thread wakes up, it doesn't wake up on some random core during contention with a cold cache. So what are bulk digging transactions? Uh, I've mentioned stored procedures already. Those are written in Java. We also support single statement stored procedures. So these are basically prepared statements. Um, it's just like the SQL you would use inside a procedure, uh, except you don't have to define a Java class around it. Uh, we also support ad hoc SQL. Um, and in, one of the new features in 3.0 is that we're now normalizing and then caching the ad hoc SQL. So that's gotten a lot faster. Um, so the Java store procedures are really what you need when you want to either push uh, application logic into the server or you want to do multi-statement transactions. Uh, so these Java store procedures uh, can contain dozens of embedded SQL statements. If you want to run tens of thousands of them, you can. Uh, you have to be aware that it's a single transaction. So if it's DML, there's going to be a new log. Um, but you can really put a lot of, a lot of work in there before you, know, you really see an impact on the overall throughput. Uh, and we have a variety of client libraries. Um, so I think we had uh, questions about that earlier. We also support JDBC. There's uh, a JSON interface, a JSON REST interface. And clients can connect to any node in the server, although there are intelligent client libraries that will actually route requests to the correct place. Now, so this is an example on the right of a multi-partition transaction executing. Uh, so you see that partition 5, which is that middle box that has the arrows coming out of it, um, that's the coordinator for the distributed transaction. So the way we get uh, serializable isolation for distributed transactions is that only one of them executes in the cluster at a time. Uh, and the way uh, the partitions involved in the distributed transaction, uh, the way they uh, maintain isolation is that when they receive the first plan fragment for the distributed transaction, they stop executing further SQL, SQL um, single partition transactions. Uh, and the reason they have, can't execute more of them is that another plan fragment could come from the uh, coordinator of the multi-part transaction. And you could also have a, a partial write because of, because of a second batch that might come with a distributed transaction 
that would be visible to the single partition transaction. And the single partition transactions are really are best represented by what you see here, where it's just a queue of them coming in, they're routed to the correct shard, and it just executes them one after the other as soon as it gets them. Okay, so some example queries. Um, really hard to show the slides to know about it. So do I have any questions so far? Any questions about okay. So yeah. in memory database, does that mean the whole data has to fit in the memory? Yes, so data views indexes have to fit in memory. They're still durable on this, but we're requiring that it fit in memory so the transactions don't block on this guy. So what if the data is too big and not fitting for memory? So it really depends on the workloads. So most database, or most uh, workloads that have data that's too big to fit in memory, they either have a subset of the data that you're actually accessing transactionally in an old and fashion, and then they have an append-only part of the data set where it's never going to change. So why would you store it in bulk? You're probably not doing one lookups on it either. But if you are, there are databases that are optimized for overflowing disk, but they're usually either not optimized or don't work well at uh, accessing that data transaction at the velocity that the does. So that's this good strategy. Yeah? The way that you eliminate the typical overhead. Yeah. In, uh, in a typical database, your database is that then you have to latch your store procedures in memory. Is that? No, it's not that it's in memory. It's that the data isn't shared between threads. So we, what we do is we shard the database, right? So normally you just shard to shard it. One node would own the data, and then many threads on that node would try and access that data. Um, so our observation was, or the HStore observation was, why would you have more threads than cores if you're sharding? Uh, there's, it's not like you're going to access that data any faster. You explain sharding. Uh, so that, this is actually that example. Um, so here we have, um, a orders table. Is this bigger than people agree? Okay, maybe not. What is a partition as a server? No, a partition is one thread of execution on the server, and there will be one thread per physical processor. Okay. What about an active thread processor? Is it one, one per virtual? Um, no, um, it's generally not beneficial. Um, and part of that is there's other prop that you usually won't even run um, run for a core, you run like three quarters, uh, because there's other data, there's other threads that do compression, disk IO, uh, and then the networking. So we break networking out to a set of threads, uh, or thread pool. Um, so, yeah. For Java stored procedures, do you guys do branch prediction on multi sql statements? You know, it's in like select, select, you know, value, you know, sex from, you know, where, where a person equals X. Mm -hmm. and if male, then do one query. If female, do some other query. So try and predict which query is going to run, or, or possibly execute both of them in advance. In advance. So no, we don't. And I, I'm curious to hear uh, what you're thinking of. So the story, when, at what point will we predict? What well, I want to do is we analyze the. You analyze the stored procedure. Oh, at what time? Uh, so yeah. actually, there's based on historic, based on historical estimates. So, so there's it's not the branch. It's like just like running a code optimizer. So the SQL statement is heavy. That's like inline functions. It's um, not quite worth it. So the, the execution is heavy weight enough that um, like we're not from Java directly accessing the data. So it's actually written in a combination of C and C++. So we actually have to do a JNI call, copy the parameters of the SQL statement. And by the time you've done that, having predicted which SQL statement you're going to do most of the time and started the execution of that wouldn't be a huge win. Um, so the, like I mentioned, if you add more logic and work to the sort of procedure, it doesn't actually change how many you can do because you're typically limited to the number of interrupts you're able to handle, um, especially if you're, uh, because you typically have TCP no delay on and get the lowest latency. Um, so you really start running out of packets fast. Um, so, uh, there's actually some work on the sort of batch prediction thing at uh, Andy Pablo uh, at MIT, uh, 
Um, but he was focused on figuring out what's the best way to shard your data to reduce the number of distributed transactions. Um, and so that would actually profile your workflow and sort of heuristically figure out, mark up chains, uh, what the best approach was. Um, so we had the question of what's a sharded table? And so that definitely deserves attention because it's uh, an important concept. So uh, normally you have all your rows on one node. And so if I wanted to shard that table, um, let's say it's the customer table, uh, I could shard on the customer ID because every customer is going to have a unique ID uh, and you'll get an even distribution across the cluster, assuming that your, cluster, your uh, customer IDs are sequential and don't have some very weird distribution. Uh, so if you were you know, parsing that entire table, let's say like doing a full scan, picking where that row is going to go, you um, hash that column, you get an integer value, and then you modulus that by the number of partitions that you have, or the number of shards, and then you, it would be basically a map to one of those shards, you send the row there. And then if a query wants to access that row, like if I do, in this example, uh, select count star from, from orders where customer ID is 5. So since it's sharded on the customer ID key, or column, uh, and I'm providing a, a discrete value for that, it can route that query directly to the correct partition. And what's important about that, what's so powerful is that it's scalable. The partition one and partition three, at no point do they even know that this transaction is going on, and they can focus completely on doing their own single partition transactions. And that's, in that way, uh, when you're accessing sharded data, it's shared nothing. Uh, because they don't have to share any of the execution process, and so it scales out very well. Uh, so another query, uh, an example of another query on the order table. This is from the orders. Yes, the orders table. So we're specifying a product ID. That isn't the shard key. So that's a distributed transaction because I have to do a scan um, uh, of, every, of every one of those tables. So I can have an index on that column, so it could be a fast scan, I would have to do a table scan, but I would still have to involve every shard in the database. So those types of transactions don't scale out. Um, and so this is an example of DML um, and how we shard DML. So in this case, I'm inserting a, a, a row into the uh, orders table and I'm providing values for customer ID. And so the customer ID value can be hashed uh, when I'm doing the insert, and that will route the insert to the correct partition. Um, the last example I have here is how we handle replicated tables. So you can see that the uh, product table is replicated, so it's infrequently changing. You don't add or remove products that often. That's different from something like stock, where you know your stock changes all the time, uh, and you might have quite a bit of it. Um, and a, so you get the data everywhere, and so when you want to correlate what the customer, the IDs of what the customer ordered with you know, human readable name of the product, you can use the replicated table to look that up without using a distributed transaction. So this is an example of, I kept the relational model, I kept SQL, now I can normalize my data uh, and not have this brain fork repeated individually in time with my database. Uh, and that is sort of the difference between Distributed single partition, sharded queries that scale out linearly or very fast, and distributed queries. So, does that make sense to anyone? Or everyone? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, you take a call. As long as you do queries on that column as a key, it's a single And you are at the top of the speed of the. And you do queries which go across the that time. Yes. Can you maintain all the sharding which is replicated across two different teams to say yes. So I can have two different uh, ways going in with two different sharding teams in the same transaction? Not the same. Oh so you want to shard you can have different tables sharded on different things, but you can't shard the same table on the same thing because then the physical row will have to be in two places. Shard the same table on different columns. There is a replication so, no, it's both of me doesn't support that. Um, and it's sort of, that's what a replicated table is. You do have it in not multiple places, but all, all places. So that's sharded on, it's not sharded at all. Yeah, but, um, so my point is, yeah. if you want to get that reverse performance on that one column that you shard on, or so, you can use the same data set, shard on different columns, 
So we have a specific use case in mind. Um, so because what we normally see is uh, that the use case for the starting the stack party is maybe getting yeah. and that's the okay. So the way you do that, that example for date range is you need to normalize. So you pick some some range of dates um, and you normalize that to a single value. So like let's say let's say I want to shard on day. So I take the Unix timestamp for the beginning of that day, and then that, that would all end up on one shard. But you actually wouldn't want to do that exactly. Um, you would want and you want to uh, chart on that day plus you know, the zero plus the value of zero to 20, so that it actually routes rights to 20 shards. Right. And that way you can scale right. Really what, what, what about something else? But why would you want to, so my, my question, our response would be, why would you want to shard on more than one column? What problem does it solve? Uh, for optimal security, if I want to get, say, if I run an application to two different regular ways, yeah. or write some two different type of applications, we can do a right and read back. Yeah. For example, you would use those three as yeah. See his reflection how initially when you create something and get application stats on it, and you might do it on a day and a time. So if you have like more than one shard, you can once your your procedure has arrived at that shard, you can run additional predicates. So if you want to look at the date and time, you can do that. You can give provide the date to get there, and then from inside the store procedure, you can then look up by date and time. So you don't need to shard on multiple columns um, to you know, wait on the data more. Uh, the purpose of sharding is to spread out uh, the data and then the query. Right, for the optimal performance, only when you query on that shard. Yes. So, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I think what he's trying to say okay. is that depending on what level, sometimes you actually Sometimes you might want to break it up into smaller chunks. I'm trying to think. Yeah. Like LL Bean sells a sweater. Let's say it comes in five different sizes yeah. and 12 colors. But they get a lot of traffic, so it's not just, you know. So you might, to use that example, you might want, actually want to have maybe a two-column table that just has medium black and then, because they just get a lot of water in there. Maybe that's the one that they're really pushing. Or they want to start up again. So, yeah. so typically what you're shard on is, not, is a piece of data you'll always have available. And then if you want to query further, so if you're, if you're in a situation where sometimes you have one key and sometimes you have another key, um, I really want to dig more into why you don't have just one large key and have that available all the time. So either a large key will get you to the correct place, or you can just use the combination of the two, and that's your shard key. But a very large key sometimes takes it takes more to bring up. Oh, okay. Even lose efficiency. I mean, it's like it's balanced. So, uh, that, that'll be version 4.0. Can we go on and not get stuck with the story? Yeah. Let's talk after. Thank you. Um, so, SQL support. Yay, we kept SQL. Um, so, select, insert, update, and delete. I cannot imagine what database wouldn't support those. Although I know a couple that didn't initially. Um, and we support aggregates, so average, count, max, and some near distributed queries. Uh, those aggregates get pushed down, so you can get parallel execution across every core in your cluster. So you can scan millions of rows per second if necessary. Uh, so we support SQL Lite, so very, very basic text support. Um, and prefix Lite can use indexes. Uh, we support materialized views using count and sum. There are also SQL column functions um, like decode or uh, what you call it, um, absolute values, basic math stuff. Uh, we also support, as a 3.0, indexes on function expressions, which is really, really cool because if you have JSON functions, you can now index JSON documents. And so you could have the best of both worlds. You could have a flexible schema, or you can have uh, you know, a related relational model and have it be a little more strict. Um, and we're very, very focused on transactional SQL. So I mentioned earlier, we're running your query at a single shard. We're running it serially back to back. 
there's no interleaved execution. If you have that long running lead, which I think is a lovely feature, uh, it's going to stop all the writes and reads that follow it from executing. So it's really a fo it's focused on transaction SQL. And then we're focused on making up for that by letting you do those queries in the right kind of database, um, by allowing you to dump your entire data set out of the DB if you want. We support uh, asset snapshots to CSV, to our uh, native format. If you want to incrementally export data to another system uh, as it's generated, we have the export subsystem that I mentioned earlier, which is really a lot like a message queue, but for rows you can serve into a table, where it provides this at least once delivery guarantee. Um, and now durability, so how do we keep your data? Um, so our approach to durability, um, as I mentioned earlier, starts with snapshots. So we, that's how we can checkpoint the database and truncate our right ahead follow. Um, and so the snapshots are copy on write. Um, we don't fork, we actually do the copy on write uh, manually in process. And so it starts with a distributed transaction uh, that marks the, all the tables. Uh, as copy on writing the database. So inserts, uh, insert the row, the row and mark it dirty uh, so it doesn't show up in the snapshot. Deletes, just don't delete. Um, they'll be deleted after the snapshot. Um, and then updates, we make a shadow copy of the row so that the snapshot can pick up the shadow copy instead of the updated version. Um, and so that gives us snapshots. Uh, those are written to disk. It's all sequential I/O, so it's really fast, even on cheap disks like my, my desktop, 7.4K 7, 7 drive does, uh, what is it, like 100 megabytes, 80 to 100 megabytes a second. Um, and it's the same for the uh, command log. It's also sequential I/O, uh, so it's really inexpensive to buy I/O for, uh, and it's very predictable. You don't suddenly get a burst of random reads that you know, throws off your 90th percentile latency. Um, so the snapshots are also compressed uh, with snappy. So how do we keep durability between snapshots? How do we keep track of uh, those changes? So we have a write-ahead log where we write um, the name of the stored procedure is going to be executed and the parameters of that stored procedure uh, to disk before we return an answer. Assuming that you're using synchronous logging where we don't return an answer until the data is on disk. Uh, so, this command log is a very high level logical log. So, it's not statement logging because we don't log as the procedure runs. Uh, the reason we don't do that is that it's too high overhead. Um, a log is actually the one shared data structure you have to have because you want to emit sequential IO to the disk subsystem. It's, it's friendly. Um, and so, it really helps if you only, for each transaction, have to do submit one thing to the log. Uh, and that way you can log hundreds of thousands of transactions per second on a single node. Uh, and so the tra transactions go into the log, and they're actually shared by multiple threads. So as each transaction comes in, it gets sent to the log. If it's Sigur's command log is enabled, we wait for the log to say, yeah, I got that one on disk. Uh, and then the transaction is executed. And at replay time, what we do is we restore the snapshot so we've brought the database to a consistent point with a specific transaction ID, and then we play all transactions from the log that have transaction IDs greater. Uh, and since they're actually sequential at 3.0, you can tell you know, the transactions are missing them. Something's a little wonky. Um, and so Acer index logging um, is uh, what you can do if you have a battery back to cache. Um, so we do group commit. So periodically, uh, the log thread will write all the data to the file descriptor or what's remaining, uh, and then call fsync and get a write barrier to the disk. Uh, and at that point, the data will be on disk. Uh, and there's really a limit on how many times you can fsync uh, to disk and also to a battery back cache. So you have to group multiple transactions together. Uh, and so that's how we can get um, very high levels of throughput, even the synchronous command log, because we can be batching. You know, if you're doing 100,000 transactions a second, we're doing, we're batching a thousand transactions every time we do an FSIN. So we also support disaster recovery, which is our name for WAN replication. Um, you can, and it works a lot like command logging. So we're shipping a snapshot, and then we're shipping the transactions that came after the snapshot, and then replaying them at a replica cluster. Uh, and our the WAN replication, the replica cluster doesn't support writes, but you can do reads. So it's useful if you have sort of disruptive long running queries you want to run. Uh, and there's a DR, there's an agent process at the WAN replica that uh, takes care of ordering all the transactions coming from the master database. Question? Yeah? Is this specific to 2.0, this new read-only replica? 
So, no, it's, uh, it's in 2.8, which is, I can't remember which version it came in, but it's uh, a few months old. Uh, so, OTB 3.0 features. Again, not meaning so much to people who didn't have to deal with 1.0. Uh, huge, huge latency improvement. Uh, in 3.0, in 2.0, latency was, you know, only order of several milliseconds, uh, and now latency is sub millisecond. So, on my desktop, 250 microseconds. Uh, with replication, you're looking 650 microseconds, and this is a tens of thousands of transactions per second. Uh, you're also looking at like a 95th percentile, uh, you know, of two or three milliseconds. So it's really a huge improvement, and it's just, it's very consistent. You don't have to deal with any hiccups from an I.O. subsystem. Um, we also don't depend on NTP anymore. Um, still good to have it running, but we don't require custom configuration. But you never did have to deal with that, so there's a lucky. Uh, we also did uh, the ad hoc SQL caching I mentioned earlier. Earlier, so ad hoc SQL used to be every time you did ad hoc, it was a distributed transaction because we did zero work to figure out what you were trying to do. Uh, and now we analyze whether it's a single partition, whether it's a read, whether it's a write, uh, and we also normalize the SQL so that they, we can look up the execution plan in the cache, and we don't have to reload it; it's already there. Uh, there's the JSON stuff I mentioned. I think that's really exciting. I mean, combined with PHP, it really enables sort of a more traditional um, you know, web workflow. We also add our online schema changes. So you can add an index, you can drop an index, you can add columns, drop columns. We already supported adding and dropping tables. Uh, and then the export subsystem that I mentioned earlier, is at least once delivery of rows. Um, that got a huge improvement. We moved it from as a client outside the server that communicated to the server with the socket, it's now inside the server. Um, that saved just so much in the way of resources when it turns out that you're packet bound uh, and network I.O. is the hardest thing to scale. Um, so it's significantly faster uh, and we're adding new export clients. So we've got export file, export to JPC, we've got a Spook client for HDFS uh, and we're always interested in adding more. We've got one guy talking about doing uh, MySQL binary replication protocol, which I think is kind of cool. So, developer reach. We have a new PHP client. It's much easier to use. It's a native C extension, and there's no PHP code. So, if you're not using an opcode cache, it loads very quickly. I'm skipping that slide. Okay. Pulling it all together, you no know, disk IO bottlenecks, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second per node, um, low cost per transaction. So, storage, not quite as free, but when it comes to throughput, it's a lot, it costs a lot less. Keeping transactions, keeping a relational data model, further lowering the cost of ownership and the difficulty of getting your application done. Uh, auto sharding, so if you're not locked into a specific hardware configuration, you can add more nodes when you need them. And you can be sure that if you do in the future, you'll be able to. Uh, so this is an example of what throughput looks like uh, in 3 now. So this is a five node cluster, um, replication's not on. Uh, and so the green line is uh, an asynchronous client. Uh, which isn't the client so much that we focused on for 3.0. An asynchronous client is kind of like a bulk, a bulk order where you just add a bunch of SQL secrets and say, hey, do the batch. Uh, it doesn't wait for a response after running each SQL statement. It just issues transaction after transaction after transaction uh, as fast as the database is willing to accept. And that gives you a really good sense of what your peak throughput is of how many nodes you could ever possibly get out of your database. So with five nodes, um, for this workload, which is a uh, key value workload, so it's like 350,000 or so, uh, and the synchronous client uh, is up to 100,000. And the great thing about um, 3.0 is that you've got straight lines, especially at small cluster sizes, which is a big deal, because if you don't do things like intelligently routing requests, you get a steep drop off from one to three nodes, because now requests that were almost going to the correct node are going to 50% and 75%. Some, some number, but it's not round, uh, percent of, of time is going to the wrong node. Uh, you can also see a blue line, which was our, our synchronous clients, which is the way uh, people traditionally work, very low concurrency. Uh, so that's only doing, uh, you know, it doesn't scale up at all because the database doesn't have enough concurrency to drive the uh, transaction distribution system. Uh, and also in this case, uh, the yellow line, which is uh, synchronous throughput, that's actually uh, 25 threads per node. So it looks like we're doing a little bit less than 2,000 transactions per thread. 
So we're looking at 500 milliseconds of latency. Uh, so this is on EC2 cluster computing instances. It's not up at high latency. They are really bad at uh, processing packets. Their virtualized instances are better. Um, I think there's additional capacity. Usually you can get 50% uh, usable capacity out of uh, synchronous clients compared to asynchronous. So this is an example of the read optimization we added in 3.0. So we can now serve reads and replicas, and without the caveat that you're reading stale data, you can't do a write and then go back to do a read, get a read from the slave, and find out that your write's not there. Um, and you can't. You also don't run into situations where you do a write, you tell someone else, hey, go look at this data over here, and then they go look it up and it's not there. Uh, it's not something you can run into in full. Um, so any questions so far? Okay, good. Oh, no. Okay, so uh, last bit about performance on this slide. Um, so the blue line is pre ig 2 um, Really nothing to see here. He doesn't notice much of a difference between writes and reads. They actually have roughly the same overhead. Uh, but the read-only workload uh, is twice as fast uh, in voltb uh, 3 um, Actually, this terminology is wrong to update this. Uh, so pre-IV2 is voltb 2.0, and uh, IV2 is voltb 3.0. Uh, so you can see that the with, because of read, rep, rep, uh, what's called transactions being sent directly to replicas uh, for reads, and the pure read-only workload is more than two times faster. So we're getting better than linear scaling because we don't have the hardware. And that extra, what is it, I don't know, 10, 15%, that's actually just routing requests to the right place. So just removing that overhead between two. Uh, a nice bit of performance. And then it shows the 95 file workload, so we're creating writes back in the mix. And you can see what kind of impact that has. Since we're using up both capacity and both master and slave uh, to deal with those. So, demo time. Uh, so, I'm going to start with showing you an actual multi B application, a motor example. Uh, the servers I'm running these on are uh, the cluster compute instances I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm using ephemeral disks for persistence. Uh, just to get uh, consistent performance with the demo. Um, so let me bring that so to the mirror. So in Bolt, um, one of the ways we win a lot of extra performance is that we have you define these stored procedures and they're pre-compiled. So you actually have an application catalog that you create. Uh, and in this case, you can call a tool to build the catalog for me. So there's a summary here of the catalog compilation process. So we'll create a voter.jar, which is the catalog, a name of the jar file that contains the catalog. It says this is the DDL file you asked me to include, ddl.sql. Um, and then it shows the stored procedures by name. Uh, it says if they're distributed or single partition, read, write, or just read only. Um, it mentions if they have a sequential scan, so it'll warn you, you know, you failed to use an index here. Uh, it'll also warn you if you created a non-deterministic procedure. Uh, and then it also shows a summary of the SQL statements that were in each procedure. So the way you will provide parameters to this catalog compiler is through your project file. So the project file is just a list of what, what schemas to include and then the class names of your stored procedures. And the DDL file uh, looks a lot like traditional SQL, so certainly for the create table statement. Um, so this uh, example application is a voting simulation. It's counting, so it bears similarity to any time you're tracking like the, the trades example or you're tracking web hits on two specific URLs or tracking know, what, how many times users have seen a specific ad. Um, and uh, we've got a table that's a contested table. So you know, there's no SQL statement here partitioning this table. Uh, if it were a sharded or partitioned table, there would be an additional SQL statement following saying, hey, this table is sharded on this column. And so this is the contestants table. So it's an example of pushing a piece of your application's business logic and policies into a replicated table, letting bolt management so that then you can use distributed transactions to make sure you're getting consistent policy enforcement everywhere. You can't run into the situation where, oh, I was caching my business logic and some of this data on the client side and it's still operating out of the cache, and so I've got this one client instance in the middle of nowhere that's still operating with the wrong logic. Um, 
uh, because you're letting Bolt manage that for your transaction. Uh, we've got the votes table, which contains the uh, votes. It's charted on a phone number, so that's an example of a key that's got a fairly even distribution once you've hashed it. Um, and the table is partitioned on the phone number column. So the votes table is a good example of uh, a table that's really viable for export. So you can use Volt to absorb you know, hundreds of thousands of these counting uh, things a second. You can write them to an export table, so you can declare this vote table as an export table, and then bulk load it into an analytic system like Vertica using JDBC uh, or, a, or MySQL or Oracle, uh, and get the benefit of having a bulk loader without having to write your own bulk loading application uh, to move that data into a system that can't really handle as many discrete writes uh, trivially. So then there's the another replicated table. So this is another example of business policy. So area code, we validate that the state provided with the vote matches the area code the phone number. Uh, those probably don't change that often. Uh, and then we've got views. So we've got an example here of code you didn't have to write. So you didn't have to write the code to maintain the views. You didn't have to write the code to get just get rollups of the views or get the uh, get the values from your distributed database. Uh, so we've got a roll up on uh, votes by phone number, and which is used to validate the phone number only votes a certain a specified number of times to enforce another business policy. Uh, and then you've got votes by contested number and state, uh, which is used to determine what states are voting for which contestant. But excuse me, just yeah. to use that example, yeah. there are states that share the same area. So one area yeah. no, I'm serious. So yeah. for this particular example, how would you how would you pull out how many people voted in But we're not a sharding on area code. Okay, all right. But that's its replicated state in this case. So you're going to have states spread across how many times? So the, the state for the phone number, so for the states, for every state, no matter whether it shares area codes or not, the, number, the votes for that state are sharded on a tradition on phone number. So votes from people in that state are going to be on every single shard. And that's important because you have states like California and New York that have a ton of, a lot more votes than, let's say, I don't know, Dakota. So yeah, um, don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. Um, and, and so uh, typically when you have hotspots like that, you want to pick a shard key that will give you a better distribution. And there are a variety of tricks for that. So it's really not the right super term, but it's the reads. And in this case, uh, all this application cares about is not point lookups to find an individual vote, like what time they came, what time they voted. Um, so if you wanted to look up, let's say, um, giving all the votes from Massachusetts, that would be a distributed query. Or if you wanted to page through them. But you can still implement that efficiently. Um, there are uh, black, black magics where you can uh, issue transaction specific shards, not by providing a real key, Key. And since you know the number of shards, you can just send one to each, and you can just drain the one, drain them from each. So in that case, you're only getting green committed isolation, and you're back to uh, the wonderful world of working around the database, the shard database. Okay. Um, so that's the DDL. It's all fairly familiar. Um, really, the only thing that Bolt does differently for the DDL is uh, this partition statement. So you're specifying um, the column that you're going to partition that table on. We don't have that. We just assume that it's replicated. Uh, we also have the only other uh, unique uh, statement that you can see is uh, for export. So if you want to declare a table as an export table. Uh, so let me show an example of that. Actually, write your short procedures in any language of the JVM that 
produce a class model with the right signature. So we actually have people doing store procedures in Scala. Um, so there's a little annotation at the front, this uh, at pop info, um, and we use that uh, for you to express what you actually intend to do, because there are some things we can't derive just by analyzing the SQL contained in the store procedure. Um, that's actually not what the apps are referred to before. Sometimes you want to run SQL that doesn't actually show you the entire data set. Um, so there's the partition info, you provide a table name, and then a number, and that number is the index of the parameter to the store procedure that's going to be used to route it. So we don't actually care um, what column it's charted on for the most part, we just care about what the value is and then we hash it, because it's the same function no matter what table. You know what, that's TMI. Um, pretend you didn't hear that. So the parameter that we're charting on here is phone number. So we're matching the DDL there. Uh, and if you were to change the partitioning in the DDL, uh, we would actually throw an error because in your procedure you said, hey, this procedure when it was written was charted on phone number, not state, let's say. Um, so the SQL statements, you can see they're predefined, they're parameterized with uh, log cards, question marks, uh, and that lets the database uh, run a lot faster from within the store procedure. So we removed a lot of procedure, a lot of overhead by not running procedures concurrently, doing them back to back. But there's really still a lot to be had uh, by not having to parse SQL. Uh, it's really a time-consuming process. And even just normalizing SQL can take tens to hundreds of microseconds, depending on the complexity. Um, and if you want to run you know, 26 SQL statements per transaction and then have time to scan several hundred rows, it's uh, definitely worth saving. So from within the stored procedure, uh, we've got a few job function calls here. Uh, so this is queuing SQL. So we're asking the database, hey, there's this uh, statement, I call it check contested statement. Uh, it's defined up over here at the top. I want you to invoke that for me, and here's the parameters to it. Uh, so it's just using basic Java bar args, and we're passing in on a scalar value in Java, so it's uh, very natural. Uh, this, the middle argument is an expectation. So it's sort of like an assertion. We're saying we're expecting zero or one row back if we don't, you know what, just abort the procedure. And you can abort your procedures at any time. If it's, uh, it's a relational database, it's ACID, so we've got a undo log. Uh, and if you throw an exception, we'll roll back your procedure. So if you've got a bug in your code, we'll roll back the procedure and then forward uh, the stack trace with the error to the client application that invoked the procedure. Um, so we're queuing multiple SQL statements here. So this is uh, sort of a performance optimization where um, rather than uh, make sort of the context switch from Java to the native execution engine for each SQL statement. Let's batch up a few and do it at once. Um, so we're getting a little bit more affinity for instruction caching and input output data area caches. Um, and then uh, if we're looking at the results here. So uh, we've got the result table, uh, the array of result tables that's returned by executing the batch. Uh, and then we're getting the row count and making sure, yes, this testing actually exists, and uh, yes, uh, we've got a, a row that says how many times we, this phone number was voted, and then making sure that uh, the number of votes is less than the number of max votes per phone number. And then in the last result, so we actually ran three different SQL statements here, uh, we're checking uh, that the state actually exists. So now we can do the DML. So by doing two separate uh, batches of SQL within a store procedure, we didn't have to wait 600 microseconds or 200 microseconds to go back to the client and then, and then, and then back to the server uh, to then go and do the DML. We also didn't have to have you know, transactional isolation that involves long-running transactions because we pushed it all to the server. Uh, so we're doing the SQL statement and doing the DML. And so in this case, uh, it's actually going to be updating materialized view, two of them, uh, in addition to inserting the row. Uh, and we can do 180,000 of these transactions in a single node. Uh, and that's because voter is one of the more trivial examples. So this is what we consider you know, a really trivial uh, store procedure. Uh, you, whether this had one or five SQL statements, we, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, okay, so. That's code. Um, so the last thing you tell Bolt, uh, when you start uh, start Bolt, you pass the deployment files. It's, it's not a very interesting deployment file. It doesn't show some of the interesting configuration. So uh, the first, first element of the deployment file describes the cluster you're trying to set up. So at startup, 
Uh, we're an asset database. Um, it's expensive to reshard. To reshard. So we try and build up the cluster uh, to a specific configuration. Uh, and then at that point, we'll start accepting client connectors and start loading data uh, and accept, uh, accepting transactions and load data. Um, so there's the number of hosts are expected. So at startup, you just specify one of them. You specify the same one to every node in the cluster. They all connect to the, the one you specify everywhere. And it's basically like a seed node that they just use to discover each other. It's an alternative to having to enumerate every single host name. Uh, we also support overrides for the various paths. So there's a route where all your data, all your directories will go by default. But if you want to have a separate disk for command logging, uh, you can do something like add a command log element, and then the command log will be put in a different path. So that way you can have a log disk and a snapshot disk, uh, which is a more traditional database configuration. There's an embedded web server, um, so you can enable or disable that. Uh, that drives the JSON API. There's also an embedded dashboard in each server uh, that you can use to get some basic performance metrics. You can run ad hoc queries on it. Um, it there's also uh, some command logging tunables in here, so you can turn it on or off. You can change the size of the log. You can change how often it's f-synced. Um, I don't want to get too involved um, in how that in uh, all the uh, minutia of the configuration options. So that's an example application. Do you have any uh, questions about the structure of what will be application? Yeah? Your stored procedure. Like yeah. Stored in SQL in uh, a Java class. So the, we store, so we do store the state, the text of the state. Right. Oh, uh, do we store the SQL in the Java class? Um, no. Uh, we store, we don't store anything in the class because you, you provide the class file. Like, it's just what comes out of the Java compiler. In the catalog, we have um, other places where we store metadata where we store the execution plan. Uh, and then at startup, we load the execution plan. And so that's actually stored in C++ uh, and native memory. It's just a map there where there's an ID, you look it up, you get a list of uh, execution nodes, and we just run. So, so that's something you can do with an SQL statement. Yeah. So that's how you as a user um, add a SQL statement to a stored procedure. Okay. So we, what we do is we, in user collection, inspect all the members of the class that are instances of the SQL statement class. And so that's, and then we go into those and we get the statically defined string. And that's how we know um, what SQL statements the procedure is going to be stored in. Yeah, then yeah, the SQL statements are up. Or us. Before we go on to more yeah. questions, uh, first I want to give a very big round of applause to Ari Weisberg. <laughs> 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 okay. I also want to announce uh, one thing. We have a jar going around. You can throw your, your uh, business card in there. Um, and you can win. A brand new set of Klipsch One headphones. Uh, they look really fancy and cool. I've never tried them. Uh, but Klipsch One headphones. You can put your card in the jar, or if you don't have a card with you, we will be sending out information on how to enter online to everyone who's a member of the group. Uh, so if you don't have a card, you have no fear. If you do, it's a lot easier to throw it in the jar. It will be passed around. Uh, and uh, oh. T-shirts. We have a lot of extra ones at the end of the Q and A, which we're about to do. Feel free to come up and grab one first come, first serve. It looks like there's a, at least ten or fifteen there. Uh, okay. The next question from the audience. Yes. Yeah. Um, can you compare ODB with other in-memory databases? Compare it. Except Hana. Are you asking me to compare it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, do you have any specific ones in mind? Like SAP Hana. SAP Hana. So, uh, I believe SAP Hana is, is the column store. Uh, so, I have a coworker who, who looked into it, but I believe SAP Hana is really focused on analytic uh, queries. So, it doesn't do the high velocity part, but many discrete updates. So, that's the thing that SAP Hana doesn't do. Also, if you wanted to have complex read write transactions uh, and many small ones, I don't think that's what it's focused on. So, you run into an ingest problem. Um, but uh, validate because I never used it and I really don't really want about it. But this is what my goal is. Oh, yes. So just 
just an add-on to that. Uh, Hannah in the future will have transactions, not right now. Okay. Right. But my question was that uh, okay. besides Java, would there be any other future options for this different language? Yes. Very, very interested. We're also we're very interested in uh, interpreting these procedures. So we can run any of the JVM. So like there's JavaScript implementation of the JVM, Python. Um, I mean, at least now that you have the yeah. API, the next step would be to have some form of a, a, a JavaScript available. So I think the answer there is that if a customer, if someone who is actually going to shop for the product asks for it, we do it. But until that point, it's probably going to have to wait because what we have now is good enough. Um, it's not really stopping people from expressing what they need to express. Uh, and also, there's um, other more important things like maybe I don't want to bring a file in my catalog. Wouldn't it be, you know, uh, if we supported interpreted languages like uh, JavaScript or Python, we run into the issue that uh, you'd have to, I guess, you provide your stuff in the next. Okay, never mind. Um, yes, there's interest in doing it, but we're waiting to be spurred on. How do you deal with extraordinarily long-running or non-terminating sort of procedures? Um, so, like for yeah. you know, while true, you know, we need to add safety concerns. Yeah. Uh, so there's right now there's not anything we can do about it. Um, you have to uh, only when you start your process. Pathological 
you know, but where your data where your data could be mis you know the data in the database could actually lead to something like an I think um, those those typically require that you do your scans as iterators as yes. opposed to materializing the entire scan. So uh, the yeah, because, scan. because arbitrary depth hierarchical queries are not supported in any dialect of uh, standard SQL that I've seen. Oh, okay. So then that's an option? No, no. It's just it's how people how people implement. You know, okay. you know, is X parent of Y? Okay. Um, Okay, moving on. Next question. Upwards and onwards. Any further questions? Yes. I just want to clarify something you said earlier. You said that basically in procedural language that supports the JPA. That can reduce, yeah. So it has to reduce uh, the correct, what we know, if the compiler goes to reflect on it, it has to find the right nested field, right fields, and it has to find a run method. But other than that, it doesn't matter what if, what language generated the like goes up those methods. So, um, so because we don't even have visibility into that. And so if you want to get really crazy, you can like you know have an interpreter for some other language in your run method just to use the interpreter. Um, but it hasn't been tried yet, I suppose. <laughs> okay, RL Weisberg will yeah. be here for further one-on-one -on -one questions if you guys want to come up uh, to talk to him. Otherwise, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Arnold Weisberg. Woo!